OK, so yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, hope all of you are having an amazing day. Our usual um, presenter Julio is sick, so yeah, I'll be moderating this session. And in today's session um, on agenda, yeah. Uh, we'll be seeing yeah, uh, what happened since the last time. Um, and we'll be hearing that yeah, why we are not going to have a 2022 or 9 uh, version of uni. Uh, and then we will be hearing from Pablo about the PIP support in bundle uh, for the advanced user who needs to install some additional module in case. So that's uh, that's one topic that we will be um, hearing from Pablo. Then uh, Anna will be presenting uh, the cobbler uh, 3.3.3, what's new uh, that is in there and how it's going to help the users of the uh, uni. We'll be hearing from Cedric on two topics. One is about redesigning the whole system list, um, uh, about all the filters and how some of the pages that we are getting rid of and making them part of filters. And uh, then uh, Cedric will be also presenting all about the Sonar Cloud, um, uh, mostly to yeah, improve the quality and how it's going to help the community. At the end, uh, we'll be hearing from Christian about uh, Uni uh, Ansible collection. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, of course, uh, at the very end, we will be uh, there will be opportunity to have any questions uh, from the development team. We also have our product manager with us, Don. So you will be have um, like we have pretty diverse uh, audience here. So with the agenda, what happened since last time? Yeah, um, one thing that is. Uh, uh, yeah, pretty important to mention is that yeah, we are not going to have um, 2022 or 9. That's mostly because uh, of some holidays. Uh, we had some problems with the test, uh, but the most uh, critical point was that yeah, yesterday we came to know that there was a critical bug with the zipper, which was uh, stopping the update. So yeah, we had to delay that um, uh, you need release unless we got a fix for that bug. Uh, besides that, yeah, uh, in the next version of Uni, we will be having all the four exporters that we had in 2004 uh, uh, in Ubuntu. Uh, it will be the same case with 2022-04. So yeah, uh, we will be on par what we had in 2020-04. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah, in in the previous slide, uh, Anna will be presenting about the Cobbler 3.3 that is integrated in Uni. And at the end, uh, yeah, just another uh, more information that yeah, we already have documentation and client tools ready for uh, RHEL and clones. Uh, only uh, and it's mostly ready for all the architectures. Only uh, architecture that well, it's still remaining is PowerPC. Uh, there we have some problem in the build service, and uh, it will be mostly postponed to the next version of Uni that will be 2022 or 11. Uh, yeah, that's. That was uh, the things from my side, and I guess now the usual um, presentation that I mentioned before. The very first presentation that we will uh, we will be having is from Pablo, and Pablo will take us through pip support for the bundle. Hello? Okay, thank. Pablo, are you there? We OK, so, so, yeah, somehow <laughs> Tim skipped me out. Uh, yeah, I'm back. So let me share the screen now. Yep, and you should see now some slides, hopefully. Perfect. OK, good. Yeah, so um, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Pablo Suarez from the Uni, who is a manager of the development team, and well, Today, we want to uh, show you how you can extend the salt bundle using PIP. So as you know, we introduced the salt bundle um, um, with the 3004 version of the salt bundle. Um, uh, we included PIP, so PIP is now part of the salt bundle. And this salt bundle, as you already know, contains um, all different Python modules that are required for the basic functionality, well, for, for the functionality that uh, Uyuni is providing. But uh, some of the salt modules that are there, you might require to have some extra 
extension extra uh, modules uh, to be able to execute. So there was the question by then on how we can extend the, the Python modules that are available inside the solve bundle to be able to run our custom states or modules, right? So now with this new uni release uh, 2020 to 10, we are um, doing some fixes around the pip that we put there um, to basically adjust the destination path uh, of the pip instance that is called when you try to, to use, for example, pip or the pip module of salt. So in the end, when you uh, use the salt pip module or you call the pip that we are providing inside the bundle, then this is going to be installed on some default path that by the way, you can over, over, overwrite uh, by this by using this um, VM pick target um, environmental variable. Um, so you can extend on demand uh, the environment there that is then being used by the bundle when running. It's that simple as calling VM sol call pip install, and then you put the packages there or simply running the, the, the pip that we, that we are providing with Python manually and even passing some custom path if you want to. Uh, let me just quickly do a demo on this. So here I have, I hope you can see the, the, the terminal now. Um, what I have here is um, just an open source 15.4 on my Unibin environment. <clears throat> and here I have uh, the Redis module, which is one of the salt modules, which has a function called time. This is uh, simply an execution module to, to operate Redis. What happened is that on the current environment, we don't have the required Redis uh, Python module uh, installed. And Therefore, we see that the module is not available. So in case that we want to simply extend the bundle, we can execute pip install. We can call Redis. And then by default, this is going to install the necessary things. And it would expand the bundle now. So if I call this Redis time now, well, we would see this trace back, but that's expected as I don't have any configuration and not passing any configuration, but we see that now the Redis module is able actually to load. Um, yeah, it's just failing. So it's as easy as this. Um, I like it how the the positive outcome of your demo is a failure. <laughs> well, yeah, you know. <laughs> I had no time yet to, to, to deploy the ready server. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, it's basically this. So, is that as easy as this? If in case that you want to, um, to, to use some different uh, environment, you can simply do like this uh, VM pick target. You can set, for example, let's say this uh, test uh, pip thingy. And then I can call the same uh, to install pip install ready. So I'm basically calling pip but passing this environmental variable. And then I will get the installation of the environment in this folder here, which we should see it here exactly. And then and in the same way, you can then execute your, your actions that are taking now the modules from here. All right. So that's it basically. Uh, if you have any question around this, um, yeah, uh, please ask. Um, we know that there were community people out there that they were request, uh, requesting this uh, functionality. So we hope that now uh, after the uni release is there, um, you can give it a try. And if necessary, we can get something back from you. So yeah, that's it from my side. If there is no questions, then thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Do we have any question from Pablo? Okay, if not, then we will move to the next session, which is going to be about Cobbler uh, 3.3.3, and it will be presenting, um, it, uh, yeah, and we will be presenting that session. Hello. Hi. Um, 
I hope Teams is liking my audio. Um, as you might see, uh, I have held this presentation before, just for all my colleagues internally. So I will be reusing the slides, but the content is the same and the advantages for you uni users is also the same. Um, we have almost uh, gotten everything to work, um, or to be more exact, QE is uh, in the midst of um, uh, accepting the changes we submitted. Um, Initially, we plan to update to Cobbler 3.3.1, but um, after box, box squashing and a few bit of fine tuning, we decided to go with 3.3.3. Um, and version 3.3.4 will follow once we uh, uh, have done the second round of box squashing. Um, notable changes for the users are that Cobbler Build ISO is now able to finally UEFI produce UEFI bootable um, ISO images. Um, and we got rid of our internal patches, except two, um, which means we upstreamed roughly uh, 13 internal patches. Um, However, the downside is that due to all the bug squashing and data validation that uh, can, comes along with it, we have a yet unknown level of performance degradation. Um, yeah, uh, we will try to improve that with uh, uh, more uh, updates to Cobbler, in, but uh, we do, since we do not know how bad it is yet, we do not know how much we need to do. Um, in regard to the Java side, um, we have changed an attribute in Java from an in, uh, integer to a double. Um, that's the size of the virtual um, disk size um, for virtual machines. Um, kernel options or kernel options post is now um, has now a different representation internally, meaning that uh, if you encounter bugs there, um, that is due to that. Um, so please be careful around these two properties. Um, we have now um, Java optionals um, to accommodate for the concept of resolved and raw values in Cobbler. Um, if something's unclear, please ask me at the end uh, in regard to that change. Um, and yeah, we did a huge update to the Java internal Java documentation, so developers have it a lot easier to work with the Java client. And additionally, we try to introduce a lot more testing, so the Java client hopefully is now more robust to changes done either from the server and or from the client side of uh, being uni uh, uh, querying the client. Um, what else has changed? Um, we adjusted a lot of set setup scripts, so hopefully the migration from the old to the new Cobbler version is smooth. Um, the final submission for SUSE Manager 4.3.2 is done, um, meaning in this case um, the UUNI version 2022.10. Um, QE now also uh, added tests for the UEFI functionality of Cobbler Build ISO, meaning hopefully it will never break. Um, and we have uh, we have um, enabled the Java test container to be ex able to be executed via Podman. Um, also, um, if you are just interested in Cobbler, you can now execute the unit test locally without any containers, meaning you can just do uh, your IntelliJ uh, run this package or module, and then you're good to go already. Um, and uh, uh, the last change, uh, which was uh, just populated from Cobbler to um, Uyuni, is that we now have a default, new default power management type, ipmilan and ipmilan plus. Um, and that's everything already. Um, thanks for listening, and I would take questions now if there are any. Uh, I know. Yes. Didn't, didn't you change the number of parameters of some functions in the API, in the XML RPC API? Uh, I had one that I had to fix last week that didn't have the uh, token parameter anymore. Yes, uh, the thing you changed was a bug in the new implementation. That was not, not a bug in the old one. That is the um, resolved thing that came with the update 2333. I don't know how that was not was not caught by the test suit, but um, yeah, it is. Mm, yeah, you found found the bug in the code I added.
OK, do we have another question? OK, if that's not the case, thank you. I know uh, this was uh, absolutely uh, a huge uh, thing that yeah, we wanted to get in. It takes a lot of effort to get this thing in. So yeah, and Anno was catalyst in this whole effort. So yeah, thank you Anno, for that as well. Um, we'll move to the next session that is going to be about a redesigning that we did with the system list page and uh, Cedric will um, go. Uh, yeah, let us go through this one. So Cedric, over to you. So I suppose you, you see my screen. Yes. OK. So, so far, no big change. Let's see in that menu here. So you you will first see here that there's no systems overview anymore because when you click that, it will directly go to a new page that is system list all. Well, there was already an all page, but this one has been refactored completely uh, into React.js. Uh, so that was the easy part, I'd say. And uh, it merges multiple pages in the systems list menu. So you see that this um, sub menu is less crowded now. There are still some pages that may be um, merged, like the unprovisioned systems may need to be removed or that is still to be figured out. And um, the UI feature, at least, is uh, not completely finished now, but you can filter here by um, here system kind, uh, system kind uh, proxy, so I can find all my proxies, or I can find all config diffs. No, I have no con, no, no nothing here. Extra packages, maybe more than zero. So, yeah. For now, it's quite com quite hard to figure out how to do the mapping between the old pages and the new ones because it's just uh, filter strings here to, to be input. But that is going to change. Uh, UI folks offered help to to replace that with proper fields. And uh, there is something that you also need to know here. Uh, the session was saying it was fast. Did you see any slowdown here? Not really. And count how many systems there are here. So I have 15,000 of systems and um, maybe I can show you the unprovisioned system page, how long it takes, because it has a lot of system, uh, unprovisioned systems. Okay. So. That is way faster now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Slightly. Uh, so there's a little trick. Uh, so the database of Uni has been designed uh, like 20 year, 20 plus years ago. And at that time, when you um, had database courses and well, we're, we're working on databases in general you were told to not duplicate data because it's a pain to maintain, because it takes disk space and so on. And um, so that, that is what we have, what we had for now in, in the uh, current database. But that means gathering data from um, a, a big lot of places just to display this list. And it was just getting, using too much time. So what happens now is that everything is gathered into one table that is somehow caching what is in the others. And this table needs to be updated. So in the code, it is updated regularly. And we can see in the schedule, oh no, no, it's not in the schedule, it's in the uh, task schedules. We have some new, where is it? We have some new actions here. Um, so we have update system overview default, this, this bunch here, which is running uh, 
every, mi every every minute every minute mm -hmm. yes so this one is a queue and it will read all the um, the entries in the uh, origin job queue or something like that the table name and it will process them to update the the, the overview table and there is another one i need to figure out where it is uh, that is running every hour uh, the last one last one on the page is that right? yeah that's the one here this one is running every hour uh why do we have this uh and by the way this is the uh, reverse this one is the queue and the other one is the one that runs every hour and um we have one that runs every hour because we may have i may have forgotten some places to update this table in the code so at least every hour we know that we are updating this table from scratch for every system so i also re realize and these don't these don't require much overhead to run right they're they're not going to run for thousands of seconds. Thousands of seconds? No, but maybe a few minutes. Okay. Like here is like two, three minutes uh, on, on my VM to update a whole 15,000 systems. Okay. But uh, I don't have that many packages in my channels. So I would need to, to test with this uh, to with many synchronized products to figure out if that changes something. Because uh, in the data, we're storing things like the number of packages uh, that are installed, extra packages, and so on, number of, of patches. And these are gathered uh, from tables that count the, um, the uh, packages also. And that may be huge. So I would need to, to do some more tests on that. So that's basically it. So it may also it may explain why there would be some some small delay between um, changing something on the system on in a, on a system and seeing it in the table here, in the view here. There may be some small delay. Um, yeah, that's about it. Any questions so far? What does yeah. the extra packages stand for in the table? I've never seen it before. Um, I think these are uh, packages that are. Um, I know. I, I, not in it. any is assigned as, panel. Is that the same as non-compliant? Yeah, it's non-compliant. Yes. I think. Uh, ah, okay. It has name extra packages, big packages that are installed on on the system that sh should not well are not listed. They in don't the have system. repository representation, yeah. right? It's basically the same data that was already there. Yeah, I didn't it change was, anything there. It was That's there. In, if you go onto an individual system and you go to software non-compliant, I'm going to guess that that's exactly what this is. That looks good. That's uh, very valuable information. So when we will see this in Uyuni and SUSE Manager? Uh, in Uyuni, I hope it will go into the next release. Uh, not sure if it will be 22, uh, 10 or 11, uh, given the uncertainty these days. Uh, but yes, the idea is to get it as soon as possible, even if the uh, the fields, the selection fields at the top are refactored after. So the, the idea is to get feedback and, and to fix that as fast as possible. So I have a question. Um, I use kind of a cheater way of of navigating uh, where I put stuff in the search page. 
I'm going to guess that your drop down list on this page uh, is not searchable in the search page to the left up there. Uh, here? No. Yeah, if you type extra there, I'm guessing it's not going to navigate to. No, no, no. It's this. Not. Yeah. It's, it's only working on, on the. Um... On what is in the in the menu? Yeah, we okay. made sure that Don cannot cheat anymore. Yeah, you're gonna <laughs> you're ruining my life. <laughs> you're making me have to navigate menus again. Oh my gosh! Um, but well, the speed is gonna help. The the question or uh, one of the questions I I have for you um, for now I just replaced the all page. And I killed the overview page. Would it make sense to move this new fast page somewhere else, like under systems directly? In some way, I'm tempted to do it. But in, in the other, it looks strange to have a, a systems list and below more systems list in, in a sub menu. The idea was to move this one up one level. OK, that's as hard as the naming problem. So yeah, we will wait on this one probably. Yeah, I don't I don't think I really care. As filters. long as it's searchable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't care, yeah. If the filter is good, the new one, what does prevent us from killing all the sub pages? Well, uh, virtual systems and virtual systems is a little bit different because you have the virtual host here that is right, added. Right. Uh, and provision is well, why did I click on that one? Um, because you wanted to show how long <laughs> it takes. <laughs> yeah, the unprovisioned system here is questionable because the only data that is valuable here is the um, MAC address and maybe the time it has been detected. Everything else seems to be not populated so far. How so, is this gathered? Um, no idea. I, I created them using the API okay. because I needed a lot of systems, so I created them from using the API. I don't know with the real life systems if we are really gathering these data. So that page, well, for now it will stay here, but maybe at some point we want to remove it and, and move the data into the old page. And the next three ones are so different that, um, yeah, it is hard to get rid of them so easily. Maybe this one, the system currency, could could be removed um, if we somehow get the scores into the old table. And the systems types here is very, very different as well. Here you have a list. Okay, so it's not so bad, so so complex with the all the types and the add-on types and so on. And here you have um, some date, some statistics on on the system types. So, uh, so um, yep. If you will allow me, I have a question for you, and maybe for people from the front end that have uh, some ideas for this one. Would it make sense? Um, until we refactor the search mechanism to, to be more user friendly, can you go to the all page? Systems all. Uh, would make sense to keep the menu entry on the left side, but but instead of pointing to the old uh, GSP do action, it could be a static URL for this page uh, with the query string with the filters that is needed to replicate the same list of systems that we had in the previous pages. Just to be easier on, on the on the users to, to get used to this uh, until we refactor the filter. Would that be doable or make sense at all for the, for the front end part? 
perspective? It is doable and uh, it's not that big a deal to add them again. Um, just want to tell you that removing these page properly and cleanly everywhere mm -hmm. was a real mess. Okay, my idea was not adding the page again, was that uh, was adding a static link yeah, with yeah, the predefined query string to the menu. For, so in the, the in the uh, function Java function that is creating the menus in here, we can do we it. Just added, we just added like a simple static link uh, to so this one. We have and no, uh, uh, and nothing related to to GSP uh, about this on uh, or the structs file. So for instance, here you have you have links already to view all critical systems. Oh oh, and then there is a, a bug it with some HTML translation. <laughs> 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 it didn't click the thing, but well, it is possible. Yeah. So the idea would be, for example, have like the um, uh, improvising, uh, not improvising. For example, the outdated systems. I'm not sure yep. if it's the right name. And then you click there, and the static link to the RNGEM system installed with the query stream. We have already some static links in the menu. I think, for example, yeah, the yeah, external we links and uh, well, help the external links are uh, static links. But even even the, yeah, system, but the new systems list is already a static link. Okay. My, my idea for this one was just uh, as a transition period between uh, releasing this and have the, the, the filtering. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, do we have another question from Cedric? Doesn't seem to be the case. Then I guess Cedric will take us through to the next session, which is nice going work. to be about Sonar Cube. This will have the biggest impact, like you said, on uh, Uyuni slash Suma systems, where you have a lot. So, um, on behalf of those very big customers, we thank you. Yeah. So for uh, for the, the next session, this the next topic is really more um, developer oriented. Uh, but well, it is kind of useful. Um, we well, I recently added Uyuni into Sonar Cloud. Sonar Cloud, what is it? It's a uh, static code analysis tool that provides an, uh, a super cool UI um, to, to tell you where are the issues and what potential bugs you will have, um, what is the code coverage that you you have. So here you have some, some data for Uyuni. Um, so it didn't improve that badly for now because uh, <laughs> It only started analyzing a few days, a uh, few days ago, like 22 days ago. And there you have two things. You have here the branches. For now, we only have master that is scanned every four hours if there are changes. And we have pull requests here. Uh, so you can see the statuses uh, of all these pull requests. And if you see one pull request here, um, so before in the past few days, initially you had a comment on the pull request, but this was spamming everyone. So I disabled that, th that thing. So you don't, you will not see it anymore. What you see is here, the, um, the Sonar Cloud Code Analysis check. And you can check the details of your pull request here, and, and you, you see if it's okay or not. The goal is to have green everywhere. Uh, you see that this one is kind of touchy because it's uh, on, the, on the line for the, co the code coverage, even though I didn't change anything. And just... Uh, reformatted some things. 
Um, the good thing here is that it also spots some common vulnerabilities and common security issues. For instance, in that particular pull request, it found me the other day that uh, we had some vulnerability because we were passing user input directly to logs. And this is um, a known CVE, a known problem. So that's pretty cool because this is uh, showing up directly on, on the pull request. You also have issues like potential null non uh, non checks. <laughs> and verse all other data. So it's really cool. I really hope everyone will benefit from that. And the idea is to reduce the number of failures that we have here on the code, on the main branch over time. You can see here uh, in, in uh, the main branch, for instance, we have issues, the list of issues that are found already. So if you have connected to Sonar Cloud using your GitHub account, it will automatically assign the issues to you if he finds that you are the one who changed the line. And um, well, it can also be a good uh, starting point if someone wants to find some uh, easy task to find uh, go through these issues. Some are very easy to fix. Some are more complex. But yeah, it, it, it really helps there. And it's not only scanning Java. It's also scanning our Python code, TypeScript, and so on. But for the analysis, we are running it only on Java pull request in theory, because we are running it after the JUnit tests. The reason for that is that we are passing the Java, the JUnit code coverage results to the scanner. Uh, so, and for now, the tool that is triggering these um, test runs is kind of buggy. It's known as Gitaro. And it may run JUnit tests on pull requests that have nothing to do with Java, for instance. Uh, so it may happen that you are just touching some Python code or whatever, and you have some Sonar Cloud report, and it's read because there is no code coverage, which is expected because we're only reporting the Java one. So don't worry about that one. And yeah, you can also see the security hotspots. It could be interesting to figure out, to read them, read them and go through, through them, figuring out what is important, what is not. You have some uh, data measurements um, on complexity, on number of issues of co code coverage, and so on. So they're really in in interesting data to dig from it. Is there any question? If not, then okay. I, I really hope you will enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for it. Yeah, it looks on. scary to me. It looks scary to me, but you know, I'm not a developer, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Cedric, for the great work on yeah on on both uh, of these fronts. Um, that takes us to the last session, unless I guess somebody was about to speak. I have um, another uh, remark is that you can connect Sonar Cloud to your IDE. Uh, there are plugins for that. So uh, I use SonarLint. Well, it is called SonarLint, and it, there is one at least for Eclipse and one for IntelliJ, maybe for some other in the IDEs as well.
Thank you, Cedric. OK, and now we will move to the next and the last session that is from our community member, Christian. It's going to be about Ansible collections. So Christian, over to you. Yes, thanks. So if I did everything correctly, you should see my presentation, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. Great, awesome. OK, for those who don't know me, I'm Christian. I'm senior system engineer at a German system integrator. And I'm focusing mainly on Linux virtualization and all this DevOps stuff. And I have been using Spacefox since version 2.0, which has been a pretty long time. And, and I'm also moderating a Linux podcast. But today we're going to have a look at Ansible and Uyuni. And the first question might be why Ansible? Suse loves salt. That's correct. And I also like salt. But many customers love Ansible and they want to use it. So. The market situation is that Ansible is a leading position while Salt is adopting and strong performer. I think everybody in this call knows this. And um, there's another requirement which I um, hear quite often from my customers, which is that customers want to have a fully automated patch management. Yeah, So a lot of my customers use Ansible automation platform or AWX and other solutions, and they have quite complex workflows for fully automated system maintenance. So they have a big dashboard and 100 things that are done automatically on hundreds of, of systems, and they wanted to have a solution for that. So what I did previously, and I think I already presented this last year, is I wrote an Ansible role for actually installing Uyuni and SUSE Manager. So if you want to simply install it and you're a lazy person like like I am, then uh, you want to have this in an Ansible playbook. So it's quite easy. There's an Ansible role you can find on GitHub and Ansible Galaxy, and it will set up a normal Uyuni SUSE manager. You can define the version you'd like to install, and you can also install things like CEFS, which is a community project that adds CentOS Errata support for older CentOS releases and so on, and you can go drink a couple of coffees, come back, and your system is, is ready, and that's quite handy. I do this quite often when I do some SUSE manager trainings because I don't want to install 10 systems manually. So that's what I did before. This, of course, also works with SUSE manager, so the only difference is that you would need to enter your SUSE customer center email address and your registration code, which is needed in order to um, get access to the packages, you need to deploy it. So the next step would be having a look at how to actually automate system maintenance. And there are a couple of tasks that customers would love to see automated using Ansible. For example, customers would like to install patches and package upgrades, maybe rebooting house, even though this is also possible with Ansible. But sometimes you maybe want to change some host information. So maybe you want to remap uh, the software channels or you'd like to address content lifecycle projects by creating new versions and replicating them to your test systems and so on. But you could also maybe want to apply salt high states using Ansible, which is quite funny because um, Uyuni has It seems like, uh, yeah, it seems kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, because Zuma has or Uyuni has this um, Ansible support where you can use salt in order to trigger an Ansible playbook and some customers want it vice versa. <laughs> so that should also be possible. All these so things you, can... you're saying you're saying that from a, an Ansible you can trigger a high state that applies Ansible playbook as well. <laughs> that should be possible. <laughs> Would it put you? Could you put yourself in an endless loop where the, the call a high state, the call the Ansible playbook, the call the high state, the call? The if you do it right, playbook. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that that should be possible, and the most things are already available if you use Space CMD. But the problem is, I have lots of customers that want to use one utility. They don't want to go to the command line. They want to have some shiny web interface, and that's why they bought Ansible Automation Platform or AWX. So I thought maybe it would be a good idea to start working on an Uyuni Ansible collection, which is what I did. So there's an Ansible collection 
that's currently only available on, on GitHub, so it's not directly reachable or downloadable using the Ansible Galaxy that will follow um, soon. And the first thing I implemented is that I wrote modules in order to install patches and system upgrades and also reboot hosts. Those modules have include and exclude parameters. So for example, let's say you have 500 updates available for your systems, you only want to install a subset of it. That's no problem. You can simply list the patches you would like to install. I'll show you in a moment. And of course, it's also idempotent. So patches that are already installed won't be reinstalled. So in case you want to give it a try, here's your requirements YAML file. Um, you simply need to refer to that GitHub URL and then you can use it. What does it look like? Here's an example playbook which can be used in order to install patches. So yeah, here's the module name stdevil uni install patches. Of course, we need to enter the API endpoint connection details. So uh, in the in the back end, there's a Python module which uses the um, XML RPC client. So of course, we need the host name, the password and the username. You can also disable SSL verification. And then you would need to specify the name of the client you'd like to patch. So here it's a, it's a test system I will show you in a minute. And in the last four lines, you can see optional parameters that are commented out. So for example, you could specify include patches. So only those patches that are listed would be installed and vice versa. If you specify only exclude patches, then all patches but not those that are part of the list will be installed. So you can install all patches or only a subset of them. That's no problem. Same goes for upgrades. So the module name changed, it's install upgrades and it's the same procedure. You will specify API endpoint credentials and you can include or exclude upgrades. So those are normal package upgrades that are not part of an, of an patch, not part of an errata, if you want to say it like, like that. Um, for example, if you have a customer who has a lot of self-packaged RPM packages and want to distribute them using that mechanism, that should also be, be possible. And I'm going to show you this in a short demonstration. So what I have here is I have an Uni client which is running on a VMware virtual en environment. It's a virtual machine. And um, so um, what I would like to do is before actually patching the system, I would like to create a snapshot and then I would like to install a patch and a system upgrade. So this is a, a workflow or a use case we um, develop for a customer. So I can show you in the next tab that uh, this is the system. So you can see I'm a quite lazy administrator. I have <laughs> a lot of patches outstanding and 480 packages that could be upgraded. And I had a look here at the package upgrade list. So for example, here's um, Visual Studio Code that could be upgraded to a newer version. So we have 162 installed and the newer version available in the repository would be 1681. And for the patches, I decided to go for this moderate security update for unzip patch, which is OpenSUSE's leave 15320223399. So my playbook actually looks like this. I have a playbook which uh, yeah, defines some credentials that I can gather access to Uyuni and also the VMware. I'm specifying here the VMware guest snapshot module. That's a module written by the community. It will create a VMware snapshot for me, which would have the name Ansible maintenance. And then, and this is the next step, um, the module would install patches. So it would connect to the Uyuni installation you just saw in the web browser. It would select this client and it would install a patch with that particular name. So only one patch will be installed. If I would install all patches, this demonstration would take quite a long time. After that, we will install the package upgrade of the VS Code. And the last step we could do is we can schedule a reboot of the of the host. So, and now what I'm going to do is I simply run the playbook. The first step is creating the snapshot, which has been created, and now the API calls for Uyuni have been triggered. So let's have a look at the VMware console. We see we have this Ansible maintenance, which has been created, and now 
uh, if I move to the Oyuni events history, then you can see that the first thing that has been triggered was the combined patch update with that particular patch. And afterwards, we have the normal package upgrade. And the last step, the outstanding task, would be rebooting the system. The benefit of this is that you don't need to access the command line interface. You don't need to access the Uyuni web interface. If you're using something like um, AWX, you can simply use it in your workflow. And you have one workflow which does all this patch preparation, the actual maintenance, and also the reboot. And you only need to use one tool. So the customer is quite interested in seeing um, him adopting this for his thousands of, of systems. So it's a really early stage, but uh, it's it's already working for this use case I just demonstrated. So maybe while we are waiting here, I can show you what uh, is planned for the future. So the Uyuni role that I mentioned in the first slides of this presentation will also be part of this collection. So I will I will move it. And I also planned additional roles. So for example, I'd like to have an Uyuni upgrade role because I'm also doing a lot of upgrades for customers for Zuma 4.1, 2.4.2, 2.4.3. And doing this manually is also quite daunting task. So this could also be easily automated in my opinion, or maybe for proxy installations, it would also be possible to define another role. Speaking of the collection modules, of course, I want to implement additional functionality. So I'm, currently I'm working on the content lifecycle project because I have customers that want to release new patches once every three months. So they also don't want to do this manually because they have a lot of systems. So they also want to have a possibility to use this in an Ansible playbook, which will then automatically release new patches for their dev systems. And after one week, then those patch version will also be released to QA and then to production and so on. So this is the next thing I'm focusing on. And as always, feedback and contributions are always welcome. So it's available on, on GitHub. You can use it. You can, um, you can create issues. You can create feature re requests. You can participate. I'm, I'm happy to see some, some people helping me if you're interested. So let's have a look at the interface. That looks good. Patch has been installed. Package upgrade has been installed. And now only the reboot is the last thing which is outstanding. So as you can see, it's working like you would see it if you do it manually or using Space CMD. Are there any questions? Yeah, just just one question uh, from my side, Christian. So yeah, very cool. Uh, really liked it. So. Um, this happened like these actions are dependent on each other, right? You finish one and then you start the next one. Uh, yeah, so if one of those tasks would okay. have failed, then the other tasks wouldn't have mm -hmm. been started. That's the logic of, of Ansible. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering about the reboot part, but yes, I guess you, uh, you, uh, it, it's, it's the last step. So yeah, uh, it, it should be fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're and you're counting on using the Ansible automation platform or AWX to be the centralized scheduler to accommodate the automation of this, or or how are you doing scheduling? In this case, we are focusing on what Ansible does. Yeah, so a lot of customers decided to put all their effort on the AWX, so all the scheduling is done at um, Ansible level. Yeah, I'm curious because we we've bantered about the idea of uh, having a SUSE equivalent Ansible to Ansible automation platform powered by Ansible, but essentially, uh, you know, support offered from us. Uh, what would you think of that? That sounds idea. great. That sounds really great because I, I had a lot of fun uh, the last couple of weeks because I'm actually um, preparing an AWX training 
And if you don't go for the enterprise version, getting uh, things running isn't that easy anymore. So previously, AWX had Docker images you could simply use, and there has also been a community project which creates RPM packages you can simply install on your CentOS or SUSE, whatever machine. But now they decided to it's develop. It's a lot harder. Yeah. yeah. They have Kubernetes <laughs> um, operator and yeah. I have never worked with it and I needed to get into micro Kubernetes, then I needed to deploy the operator and then deploy an AWX using the operator. So a lot of new topics for me and I think it would be awesome to have an, another possibility or another option by somebody else which may uh, make things easier again. So I'd, I'd really like to see that. Great, good feedback. No, um, when you get ready to do the proxy installer with this, I think it would be smart for us to make that be the container-based proxy. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, yeah. And if you have questions, I'm here to help. Yeah, Cedric and I have uh, bounced that one around a lot. Awesome. That sounds good. Um, as we were talking about Ansible, are there any news on the technical preview state of Ansible in Zuma? Because I have a lot of customers that are asking me whether they are news and they would they'd love to see uh, new functionality going into that. Um, so, yeah, Abed yeah, and Pablo, are you guys going to speak to that or do you want me to? You can and then we can. Give our opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, honestly, we have really have not had very much customer feedback on requested features and additional functionality. So it's kind of been uh, frozen at what we introduced with 4.2 un until we, we know really where uh, putting additional effort into it matters most to customers. Okay. So what, what I hear quite often is that people love the salt stack formula functionality so that you have the option to simply use salt stack formula without knowing uh, all the um, technical details. And um, a, a lot of customers would love to see the same for Ansible roles. So having a uh -huh. menu, where you could say, okay, that's my system, and I want to drag and drop this uh, geolink guide or Docker role. I want to have this geolink guide or Apache role and PHP, and then hit play, and then um, these roles will be executed. Because this is mostly the same what it looks like in um, Foreman and Catello or Red Hat Satellite, yeah, which is really basic functionality. You can simply assign roles and playbooks to systems. It's nothing special. It's not what AWX can do, but it's right, right. it's 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 the most basic functionality which is enough for a lot of customers. So not everybody needs an Ansel automation platform. Yeah, it's a lot of feature. That it's a lot of money, use. and it's a lot of money. Definitely, <laughs> if you see the uh, the pricing list, you know yeah. where all the money. That's why goes we in. have considered going into that business because I'm fairly <laughs> certain we could have. Uh, a functionally similar offering for significantly less money. That would be awesome. Yeah. I mean, they set their price because they're the only ones doing it. And yeah. And, you know, maybe having another entry in the marketplace would matter. But that thank you for great. that. That would be good. That's really good feedback. Thanks. So if we get down to the place where we're considering a prototype, you'll be my first contact. Definitely. So if you have something you want to show me, count me in. I would, I'd love to get my hands on it. Well, and but in a more immediate sense, what Cedric offered on uh, doing the proxy build with that, um, we're, we're more than happy to work with you on that. That sounds great. I don't know. I, I think <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of code which has been written for SpaceMD might be 
suitable for reusing in that collection. So if anybody of, of you wants to have a look at it, I'm always happy for ideas and merge requests or thoughts what how it, it could be implemented. Uh, by the way, okay. do, is there any reason you're using the XMR PC API, or did you see the uh, the new uh, JSON over HTTP, or don't know the exact name? <laughs> I saw it, and the problem is legacy customers. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so I have I have some customers which still have. Suma really old of versions Zero. of Suma. Yeah. <laughs> no, not not that old. So I migrated all that three uh, dot x and two dot x um, customers, but some of them have four dot zero or maybe four dot one. And I think uh, the new API has been introduced with four dot three. Four three. Yes. Yeah. And it's a technical preview, <laughs> so it's not ready for production yet. Um, we are just going to remove that uh, technical preview label. So with ah, next awesome. version of Suzy Menje, uh, you won't be seeing it technically. In 432, it will be fully supported. Oh, correct. Awesome. That's great mm -hmm. news because that's the main reason why I'm not using that new API because I, I want to still support the old versions because I mean, you can still use Suma 4.2. It's still supported. Yeah. If you are, um, about the right support level, so I, I didn't want to uh, break um, the functionality for those legacy customers. <laughs> but that's a good point. I will add it to the GitHub issue list. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your work on this. It's just amazing. It's really, really cool. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. For Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, just one one more thing about Ansible. So with this ALP, uh, you probably know uh, that uh, story that's going on in Zuse. Uh, we are putting a big focus on uh, Ansible. And uh, so in our next generation expect, of Linux, Linux, that's what ALP is. It's what comes after SLES 15. Right. That's what he's talking right. about. So we are, uh, yeah. This, this is definitely on our agenda to improve Ansible support in in uh, Zuzi Manager as well, or Uni to say. Great. Okay. Do we have any other question from Christian or from anyone else? We have five minutes up, but yeah, it's Friday, so yeah, maybe we could. <laughs> yeah, everybody's anticipating the. <clears throat> they move there's, from this meeting to the pub. <laughs> there's a question to the in the chat, uh, saying lots of discussions on Ansible. I hope there's there are no plans to start taking away salt, and I'll let Abby answer. But I'd say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no way. Yeah, people want us to get us away from salt, but no, we are not going away. <laughs> You're not going there to is, salt, salt. That food. would be uh that would be a monumental shift. Uh, you know, the truthfully, you can use Uyuni and Susa Manager without understanding salt because it's going on under the covers and you know salt states are part of what we deliver, but we make it possible for you obviously to add on all your own salt states and do all your own salty things. And the primary reasons that we picked salt in the beginning are still viable today. Uh, we didn't pick it because of popularity. Uh, we, we picked it for a couple of primary reasons. One, um, client communication. Uh, there is nothing equivalent anywhere that does NAT traversal from a client to a server better than the, the salt minion. Uh, it just NAT creates a so much simpler way for you to talk between server and client without having to do uh, 10,000 firewall adjustments for uh, SSH, SSH paths. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously secondarily, uh, We've had we've had uh, been able to introduce new features a lot faster since the salt thing. It offloaded so much of the 
what was having to be done centrally on the SUSE manager server to the remote salt clients. Um, and we have a ton of really powerful, smart salt guys uh, uh, here at on this team uh, that make stuff happen in ways that uh, we just, uh, it's, it's revolutionized it. So it's been great. But no, we have no plans to uh, to deprecate any of that business at all. Just to give a, yeah, sure. <laughs> just to give a perspective from a technical point, we start introducing uh, salt uh, as a replacement for traditional stack. How long ago, Don? Do you remember? I probably five, six years ago. Um, and we are just now starting deprecating the traditional stack, so you can see the, the amount of effort. Uh, development team has put on, on integration with salt so it doesn't go anywhere in the near time for sure yeah and uh, yeah just to add one more thing i uh, jeff already mentioned when yeah when it comes to scalability we cannot see a better solution out there than salt uh, we don't think that ansible is um, that easy scalable the way we are using salt mid suze manager so yeah, there's there are quite a few strong points that yeah make us stick with salt. Yeah, and it's not really about, as you've pointed out, Christian. Uh, <clears throat> there's some really cool synergies that are possible in coexistence and taking the strengths of each. That uh, there's just not a reason to be uh, Ansible only or salt only. You're right, and using salt doesn't exclude using Ansible and vice versa, and it's always good to have a plan B. Yeah, So we don't know what will happen with Ansible or salt at some time, maybe. So having the option to use both is, is a great idea, in my opinion. Yeah. There's always some reticence when a tool is owned by your primary competitor, but... Uh, like Ansible, but sometimes, you know, we do a lot with Red Hat-ish things and, and we live just fine on the open source side of that. We'll see, we'll see what happens, but no, I think, yeah, we're gonna, we'll, we'll keep doing both for quite a long time. Okay, I guess that yeah, we will end this uh, community hours. It's 10 minutes up. So yeah, thank you everyone for the patience, for all the good questions and for the presentations. I wish you all uh, a nice weekend and yeah, happy hacking. Bye. Thanks everybody. See ya. Thanks. Thanks. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.